Welcome to the God's Peculiar People podcast, where we learn about the lives and characteristics of God's people. Welcome back to the God's Peculiar People podcast. Today we are looking at the third and final for this series, Era of Modern Missions. In some circles, there's thought to be a fourth era. We could talk about that, but we'll stay at the third era for this podcast. So the third era runs from 1934 through to the present day. Now, a quote that goes along with this third era is from Ralph Winter. It says, the imperative of the Great Commission extends to every people group, not just to every modern country. The idea that missions was more than just reaching a country, missionaries needed to reach every person, started to form in the years between the two world wars. And one of the leading people in this cause was William Cameron Townsend. Townsend set out for Central America, where he began selling Bibles to farmers and villagers in Guatemala. But he soon realized that most of the people he was meeting did not understand the Bible in Spanish. There are 25 languages spoken in Guatemala, and while Spanish is the official and most spoken language, there are an additional 22 different Mayan languages, as well as two other indigenous languages spoken in the country. Townsend realized that if people could not read the Bibles, how was he actually reaching the people for Christ? He abandoned his attempts to sell Spanish Bibles and started a school to teach the Quechua people how to read and write. However, there was a problem. Townsend did not have a Bible in the Quechua language. The people asked him, why didn't God speak their language? And was he only the God of English and Spanish speakers? Townsend would spend the next 10 years of his life studying the complex Quechua language in order to create an alphabet and translate the New Testament for all the people. Deep down, Townsend thought that everyone, man, woman, and child alike, should be able to read God's word in the language of their heart. So he started Camp Wycliffe, a linguistic training program that grew into two organizations, Wycliffe Bible Translators and the Summer Institute of Linguistics. So with Townsend, we see the start of the third era of modern missions. Now, again, this is not to say that no one else had been doing this before, that no one else had been going specifically to people groups. We kind of can see that a little bit with Mary Slessor. She was going not only inland, going from the coast, first era, going inland, second era, but she was also going to specific people within that inland area. And so we can see hints of the third era of modern missions as well. The significance is that at this time, there's more emphasis put on reaching certain people groups. That's what became a much bigger theme uh, during this time. And now the theme has kind of changed a little bit, I would say. People talk a lot about people groups going to certain people, but also like that 1040 window going to specific nations, but people within those nations who have possibly never heard the gospel and that take a little more creative access, in other words, you're here, to be able to reach some of the people. Uh, many countries are still not open to the gospel. In the mid-1950s, all the missionaries were pushed out of China. China Inland Mission lost its access to be in China as well as all the other mission groups. However, trying to be creative, um, we have now the term creative access missionaries or missions fields. Uh, there was another term used before, and I've forgotten what that term is called. Um, I know we've used the term closed country. But there's another one. I'm forgetting what it is. But now the, the common term is creative access country. That someone's going to a creative access country. And so we see people finding various methods of being able to go and reach people with the gospel. Now, during this era, other groups were formed. And I'm going to read a list of mission-related organizations that have been founded in this third era of modern missions. Now, this is not an endorsement of all the groups, but just a reminder of the ways people have found to reach individuals with the gospel in this era. And this is only an overview. I know there's many more groups and organizations I could mention, but these are just the ones that I've heard maybe something about. One of the first ones that was started in 1935, Frank Laubach, an American missionary to the Philippines who perfected the Each One Teach One literacy program. In 1939, missionary Joy Ritterhoff made recordings of gospel songs and a message. She sent it into the mountains of Honduras, thus beginning the gospel recordings ministry, now called Global Recordings Network. 
1945, Mission Aviation Fellowship was formed. 1951, Campus Crusade for Christ was founded at UCLA. In 1952, Trans World Radio was founded. In 1955, the Dutch missionary, Brother Andrew, made his first of many Bible smuggling trips into Communist Eastern Europe. Bible smuggling saw a spike during the fall of communism in the Soviet Union, but Bible smuggling still takes place in nations today, particularly those we mentioned that are, would be considered a creative access nation. In 1960, Kenneth Strachan started evangelism in depth in Central America. In Morocco, 18,000 people replied to a newspaper ad by Gospel Mission Union, offering a free for correspondence course on Christianity, and Lauren Cunningham founded Youth with a Mission. In 1969, OMF International began industrial evangelism to Taiwan's factory workers. In 1907, Operation Mobilization launched Logo Ships, which take books and other materials for people to purchase in ports. In 1979, production of the Jesus Film commissioned by Bill Bright of Campus Crusade for Christ was commissioned. In 1934, STEM, or Short-Term Evangelical Mission Teams, a ministry by Roger Peterson was founded and settled the rising importance of short-term missions groups. In 1989, Adventures in Missions, a short-term missions agency, was founded. Also in 1989, uh, which is interesting, I thought it was much farther back, but the concept of the 1040 window began to emerge. Makes sense why I heard so much about it growing up. Um, I thought it was a much older concept, but it, it wasn't. Sorry, 1989. And then another one, 1999, Trans World Radio went on the air from Moldova using a 1 million watt AM transistor. So as I said, growing up in the 90s and early 2000s, I heard many preachers and missionaries talk about the 1040 window. And in 2013, I went to a country that was just below, just outside the 1040 window. But the missionaries that I worked with, you know, we can see the three eras of missions through the work that they were doing. So the missionaries I worked with, they had gone inland to work in the heart of the country, but they also had ties to the coast where they would assist churches in the capital city. But while I was there, we also, we went to a village well off the beaten path that no vehicles could drive to where a specific group of people uh, lived where I was told that I was the first white person to visit there, which seems very, very hard to believe. How in the year 20, yeah, it was the fall, fall of 2013? Yeah, the fall of 2013. How could I possibly have been the first white person? And so it makes you realize that still today, there are so few missionaries that leave the larger cities to strike out into the heart of the country. And it's very, it's easy, it's possible that this village might never have been reached with the gospel before. Maybe someone had come with, from a business venture side, that the chance that someone had come with the gospel was very, very low. Now, we can't leave the third era of modern missions. We can't wrap this up without talking about sacrifices of, that took place in the third era of missions. We've looked at the start of many organizations and the variety of methods used to reach the gospel, but also during this third era of modern missions, there have been missionaries who sacrificed their lives to share the gospel, uh, both unreached people groups and just with people in general. Quickly, let me explain two terms used here, the unreached and unevangelized. The unreached are considered those who have little to no access to the gospel. Many of those are in the 1040 window. While those who are unevangelized are those who have not heard the gospel, but they live in areas where they have access to it. For example, in the United States, 99.9% .9 of people have access to the gospel. There are churches throughout the country where someone could go and learn about Christ. There are billboards, radio stations, websites, tracks, etc. that will point someone to Christ if they want to learn more about him. But one of the saddest and most written about stories of this era of missions involves an unreached people group and the five men that tried to reach them. The five men were in Ecuador, working among the people of Quito. They heard about a group of people called the Walrani. This group of people were living in the jungle, isolated from the modern world, living as their families had done for years gone by in the jungle. The five men made contact with the Walrani by dropping gifts into the village from the sky. Then they found a beach where they could land a plane, and all five men lived on the beach near the Walrani village, calling out words in their language, hoping to make personal contact with them. And after a time, 
they were approached by a few people from the Walrani tribe. The five men showed them the plane, spoke the few Walrani words they knew, and even took one of them up in the airplane for a ride. Everything seemed to be going so smoothly. They had been able to reach and make contact with a group that no one before had been able to reach with the gospel. But what the five men did not know was that back at the main camp, tensions were very high. There had been a disagreement among the people in the camp and those who had visited the white men. And while Jim Elliott, Peter Fleming, Ed McCulley, Nate Saint, and Roger Udarian waited in hopes of speaking with the Waurani again, those Waurani who were angry went and killed the five men on January 8th, 1956. At that time, it felt like their lives were wasted. But two years later, following their death, in October 1958, the door was open to the wall running to the extent that Nate Saint's sister, Rachel, and Jim Elliott's wife and daughter, Elizabeth and Valerie, were able to go and live with Wild Ronnie and share the gospel with them. And from that, many of them have made professions of faith. Now there's others who also died during this third era of modern missions. Many of them have been forgotten, but there's a few names uh, that I found and incidents that I want to mention. One is something very similar to what happened to Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, and their three friends. And this took place before their incident. It was in 1943 when five missionaries with the New Tribes missions were martyred. These men were Dave Bacon, Bob Dye, Cecil Dye, George Hoshback, and Eldon Hunter. Very similar story. If you have a chance to read about them, it's very interesting because it does have a lot of similarities to the story of Jim Elliott. In 1964, there were separate incidents when rebels in the Congo killed missionaries Paul Carlson and Irene Farrell, as well as brutalizing missionary doctor Helen Rosevera. In 1999, veteran Australian missionary Graham Stewart Staines and his two sons were burned alive by Hindu extremists as they slept in a car in eastern India. In 2001, New Tribes missionaries Martin and Gracia Burnham were kidnapped in the Philippines by a Muslim terrorist group. Also in that year, Baptist missionary Ronnie Bowers and her infant daughter were killed when a Peruvian Air Force jet fired on their small floating airplane. Though severely wounded in both legs, the missionary pilot Kevin Donaldson landed the burning plane on the Amazon River. And in 2004, four Southern Baptist missionaries were killed by gunmen in Iraq. So this wraps up our series on the three eras of modern missions. We simply skim the surface of what has taken place in modern missions since 1792. But I do hope you will take the time to pick up a few missionary biographies and learn more about these people who had given their lives to share the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and rose again three days later to save us so we can spend eternity with him. If you have any thoughts or comments about the missionaries we've spoke about or any of the three eras of modern missions, you can leave a message on YouTube in the comments, on Instagram, or on the blog post for this episode. We'll be back next week with the book review of the month, so hopefully you'll tune in next Tuesday for the next episode of the God's Peculiar People podcast.